Good evening, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are in the world, uh, and welcome to this evening's Naval Order of the United States Naval History Virtual Lecture. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, first I want to go through some of the logistics. Uh, you'll see a scroll bar at the bottom of the screen currently giving you guidance. If you have comments, you should see a comment bar on your screen. Uh, when you make those comments, I will see them at the end of uh, Mr. Uh, Siebert's presentation. Uh, we will uh, entertain your questions. So please, as you're listening, if any questions come to mind, don't hesitate to write them in the comments bar. Uh, in case any of you are new guest we're not already companions of the naval order if you have a naval uh, legacy or if you are a naval legacy person that includes the marine corps the coast guard uh, noaa and of course the navy uh, please consider becoming a, a naval order companion you can find more information either at the uh, na our commandery's website, now showing below, or at the uh, Naval Order of the United States website. Scrolling below now. Uh, Naval Order is the America's uh, oldest hereditary, exclusively navally focused society. Our mission is to preserve, promote, celebrate and enjoy our nation's sea service history and heritage again for more details i refer you to the website showing below or just type in naval order of the united states in your search bar on your web browser now without further ado i want to introduce this evening's guest speaker uh mr peter siebert Mr. Seward is the president and CEO of Philadelphia's Independence Seaport Museum, and he brings an award-winning three-decade career from notable institutions, including the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the Millicent Rogers Museum, the National Council for History and Education, and the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Uh, a Pennsylvania native, uh, Mr. Seward grew up in the Harrisburg area and earned a Bachelor of Humanities and Master of Arts in American Studies from Penn State University. He's authored several books and currently serves uh, on the board of Pennsylvania Museums. He's a former member of the uh, DeMuth Foundation, the Pennsylvania Dutch Convention and Visitors Bureau, and the National History Day Advisory Board. I um, want to welcome you, Peter, to our presentation this evening and look forward to hearing you tell us about uh, one of the uh, ships that influenced my uh, life. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm a native son of Philadelphia and uh, visited the Olympia countless times. I watched them uh, bring it alongside when it was first became part of the Philadelphia Seaport Museum. Um, with that, Peter, we go ahead and go into slideshow mode um, and uh, uh, tell us a little about what you're going to tell us. And as you're moving your presentation to slideshow mode, I will bring it up on the screen. Okay, great. Well, and, and thank you um, so much, Fred. I appreciate that. I'm going to start in just two seconds uh, and bring it up uh, for everybody to see because you don't need to see my face. You want to see some pictures of a pretty impressive ship. But I just wanted, again, so you had at least a face with it all as to who the voice was, just spend a moment and introduce um, the institution I run. The Seaport Museum was founded back in 1961, um, and we were actually several blocks inland and then moved to our present location down along the waterfront in the mid-1990s. And, you know, arguably our most cherished item in our collection is what I'm going to be talking to you about. So let me go and start right now. Hopefully you've got a pretty big colorful view um, of Cruiser Olympia looking at you this evening. Um, in my world in the museum world, we love hyperbole. 
we'll say it's the first and the biggest and the best and the most, and we love doing that about anything. And museum people are famous for doing that. Um, and I've always tried to kind of not do that in my career because there's always somebody out there when you say you're the first, they're going to go, no, actually, I was the first. But uh, when Peter, it comes to, yes. I hate to interrupt, but on our screen, it looks like we've got a partial screen with you in slideshow mode and a partial screen still showing the um, non-slideshow mode. Huh. So let's see if you can get into full slideshow mode so that the Olympia takes up the entire screen. There okay. we go. Okay, I'm out of here. Are we cooking with gas? Good. We're good. All right, sorry about that. Um, we used to call them gremlins, so uh, that, that was what got us was a gremlin this evening. But Olympia is really, um, when we talk about its, its list of firsts um, and its significant, it, it really does sort of fall into the pantheon of, of truly not only just a national treasure for the United States, but arguably a global treasure. Um, of World War I US naval vessels, fighting vessels remaining, she is one of two. Of cruisers of her type, of this, this type dating before the, the, of the 19th century, she is one of two and the only other one is encased in concrete. So she is the only one who is still in water and afloat. Um, she has an amazing list of firsts, an amazing list of things that she witnessed during her time. And um, she is certainly a, a pride for us to have. And I think for anyone who has a passion for the history of American, of American military prowess, of the U.S. Navy, of the story of technology, of, of the fighting spirit, th this ship is really a place that you've just got to come and visit. Um, she's sitting in the Delaware River, uh, pretty much exactly where this photograph shows her. It's a little cold, cold and icy out there tonight, but you would pretty much get the same view of her. Um, 344 feet long, 53 feet wide, top speed of 21 knots, 444 crew members, uh, sailors and Marines. Um, so that's kind of you know, the overall um, highlights of who she, who she is. <clears throat> what I thought I would do this evening is maybe do a, a couple of slides that just take us through the history of where she came from and what's so unique about her. So here in 1892 is a very rare photograph of her um, at the moment of her birth uh, in San Francisco. And she was launched in 1892. However, uh, she was not fully outfitted and um, actually put to sea until several years later in 1895 uh, when she was became part of the, of, the, of the Southeast or the Pacific Squadron. Um, it took her three years to fit it all out. And she really was part of a whole line of um, armored cruisers that came about as a result of really rethinking uh, the role of armored ships in the United States Navy at the end of the 19th century. A lot of scholars, I think, have looked at the period after the Civil War and running into the 1880s and the 1890s is really a period where um, not a lot of advances and changes occurred in US Navy vessels. And then all of a sudden was the realization that we needed to look to building more modern ships. And so Olympia becomes part of what starts in the 1880s as a modernization. And it was constructing ships like her that were armored cruisers um, and you had riveted plate armor on her, and then directly behind it were the coal bunkers that fed her boilers, and those coal bunkers were intended to be there to absorb any, any blows to the ship's hull. Um, she was heavily gunned for her time, and I always have to look it up to remind myself of it. Uh, ten five-inch guns and four eight-inch guns was her original complement. Olympia is launched in 92, and she really does become um, a, you know, a proud flagship of the United States Navy in the West. This is a photograph around, or not a photograph, excuse me, a, a, a print done around the time of the Battle of Manila Bay. 
And I show her she's right there in the center, um, just in contrast with how she was sort of perceived um, as a really critical part of, of the Navy presence in the Pacific. But when we talk about the Spanish-American War and really her moment, I have to sort of step back and talk about this. And of course, what you're seeing here is the remains of the Maine. Uh, 9.40 p.m. on the 15th of February, 1898, the explosion, still debate about the cause of, um, but eventual, but what we do know is the loss of approximately 262 men. Uh, this event, which uh, was seen as a triggering moment of the Spanish-American War, um, and also an important moment, frankly, in maritime history. And it's fascinating because People have said, and when I started here, I even heard people say, oh, the Maine and the Olympia, they were sisters. Well, they really weren't sister ships, but people bookend them because the Maine, of course, is the beginning of the war and the Olympia is the end of the Spanish-American War. Um, the end coming here at the Battle of Manila Bay. In Manila Bay, May 1st, 1898, seven Spanish ships, six American meeting this is a really wonderfully dramatized, but probably not very accurate depiction of what happened that day. Um, the American squadron steaming in, engaging the Spanish fleet. Um, there were five separate passes that Dewey, who we'll talk about in just a moment, made with the American fleet to the Spanish ships um, from between 5,000 and 2,000 yards. 5,859 shells were expended and 145 of them hit. So um, as one person said to me, really um, the proof of the Battle of Manila Bay was the speed of American gunnery, not necessarily the accuracy of it. You can judge that for yourselves, but the Battle of Manila Bay really is a, a critical moment um, not just in terms of defeating the Spanish fleet. Um, and there are people who would argue and say the Spanish fleet was probably not as dynamic or as strong at that point in time. Um, Spain as a global power was not a, a dominant power and that a lot of those ships, frankly, were probably pretty easy to sink. Uh, that, to my mind, sort of minimizes the impact of what this moment was because Manila Bay really signals the coming of age of the United States, particularly as a Western Pacific power. Um, the coal that was needed to fuel Olympia and her sister ships and the islands that we needed to hold that coal and to provide refueling really lead to the establishment of an American military presence in a very big way in the Pacific. Um, and he steams out from Hong Kong. The American fleet had been in Hong Kong Great Britain opted to remain neutral in the Spanish-American War, so we were kind of asked to leave in a very nice way, um, and we headed for the Philippines, and we had the Battle of Manila Bay, and, and pretty much American victory um, and ending of the Spanish-American War. For me, it's, it's fascinating coming here to the Seaport Museum because one of the things every year on the anniversary, the May anniversary of Manila Bay, the Filipino government sends from their consulate representatives here to have a ceremony on Olympia. And they do so because they feel that moment, the Battle of Manila Bay is the birth ultimately of uh, the free country of the Philippines and that it still remains very, very important to them. So her significance at that moment, you know, truly is as the leading actor as it might be on, on a great drama on stage. And you know, Admiral Dewey saying you may fire when ready gridly becomes immortalized in, in time. But as we talk about that, I think we have to pause and talk for just a moment about Admiral Dewey. And I wanna thank my colleagues who I talked to in preparation for this call, uh, because as many of you know, he is um, a, a member of uh, <coughs> the Naval Order. I'm sorry, my cough this evening. And in fact, he was the longest serving national commander of the Naval Order. So he is one of your own. Um, Dewey was born um, in that great maritime state of Vermont. And I say that jokingly, and my family has ties to Vermont, so um, I no, no comments about Lake Champlain or anything, but he was born 
um, in Montpelier, and he attended the United States Naval Academy, graduating in 1858. And he serves during the Civil War uh, on both the Mississippi River and then, and then elsewhere. I mention that because I think we make the assumption that the Battle of Manila Bay and the Spanish-American War, that's a separate from the Civil War. And yet there were many people like Dewey, not just officers, but enlisted men who served during the Spanish-American War, who would also serve during the Civil War. And there's, in fact, the story of two sailors on Olympia, both of whom served during the Civil War. One wore the blue and one wore the gray. And supposedly the story goes that they would get into fights from time to time that had to be broken up as they were sort of reliving the battles of 18, you know, 1860 to 65. Dewey um, serves in a number of posts after uh, the, Amer the, the Civil War. His star is definitely rising. Um, and in 1896, he is uh, given command of the Asiatic Squadron. And it's interesting because he was not the senior officer to get that. Um, Commodore Dewey, as he was known at that time, was, a was one of the more junior Commodores but he was a very close friend of Teddy Roosevelt and having friends with TR certainly was very, very beneficial to him and really advanced his career. Uh, when the Spanish-American War started, he frankly didn't think the war was worth fighting, but he did say that if he had to, he felt he could pretty much lick the Spanish and he did. And he continued, he was uh, celebrated and feted after the Battle of Manila Bay uh, the statistic that I like was that the year after the Battle of Manila Bay, Dewey, as a first name, went from something like 119th to like 15th most popular name to give to a new baby. So any of you who have an Uncle Dewey or Great Uncle Dewey or Great Grandfather Dewey, um, you were part of that mass who named their children after Dewey following um, the Battle of Manila Bay. Um, he serves on and dies in 1917. At the end of his career, he becomes very involved in many organizations, the Society of Colonial Wars, the Order of Founders and Patriots, um, the uh, Sons of the Revolution. He becomes very involved in many of those organizations. And really, uh, when he passes, is hailed as the great man that he was um, and important for his role during the Battle of Manila Bay. So what happens then after Manila Bay? Well, Olympia continues to serve. This is a photograph of her at the time of the Great War, the First World War. And if you've got an astute eye, you've noticed something has changed. She no longer has turrets. Um, there was a recognition that the turrets were not effective. Um, and so they were removed both fore and aft from Olympia and gun platforms were used in place. In addition, she had, at the time of the Spanish-American War, um, rows of small caliber guns along her decks. Those were designed to prevent small craft from approaching her, and that was not seen as needed during the First World War, and so a lot of those were stripped off of Olympia as well. Um, she did primarily serve as doing anti-submarine duty up and down the east coast of the United States and ferrying convoys across uh, the Atlantic. Um, at the end of the war, um, and, and I, before I get to that, actually, I love this photograph. This is a postcard, which is why it's a little bit grainy, but this is Olympia on the left, and you see this canard steamship Avernia on the right. The Avernia was literally twice everything, twice the width, twice the length, twice everything to Olympia. And this really does show in many ways, how the world was changing by the time of the First World War, both in terms of, of all, all manner of, of, of ocean-going vessels. And so we have Little Olympia here and the Avernia. Avernia was actually what they called an immigrant ship, which meant that she was primarily used to bring immigrants from Europe to the United States. At the time of the First World War, she was pressed into being a troop ship. And the interesting thing is the Avernia ended up being sunk by a German submarine during the First World War, but Olympia continued onward. So small and mighty um, does win the race, and uh, she continued onward. After the conclusion of the First World War, Olympia remained in Europe, and, and she was fulfilling not just active duty roles,
but she also had a lot of ceremonial roles. Um, so in fact, uh, she represented the United States at uh, the coronation of the Tsar of, 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 of Russia. She was sent along uh, the Adriatic and into Italy um, in the post-war period in 1918, or two, in, in 1919, 1921. Uh, she was sent there to help ferrying supplies during the Spanish flu epidemic. She was also sent there because many of the Adriatic towns um, were being raided by bandits. And so her presence was sent into many of these harbors very much with the intent of sort of showing, um, a, you know, a heavy cruiser chase off the bandits. So she was doing a, you know, a lot of good peacekeeping duty in the post-war period. She was also, as I noted earlier, a part of the, 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 the ships that were sent to Russia, not only at the time um, uh, to celebrate the coronation of the Tsar, uh, but also to uh, fight against the Bolsheviks and the Red Russians on the side of the White Russians. So she has a, a very, very interesting post-World War I history. And then comes her arguably one of her most sacred duties, um, one that really um, I think we need to pause and talk about for just a moment. In 1921, there was um, a considerable effort in the United States to bring home an unknown soldier who had perished in the battlefields of the First World War. Um, and the idea of the unknown, of course, I think we're all familiar with, but it was, of course, a, a very elaborate process of, of randomly choosing a body and then transporting that body from France to the United States. Why? Because there were so many folks at home who had lost husbands and um, sons and uncles, um, and who did not get a body, they, 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 they were lost. There was no return of remains. And so the unknown becomes representative for those families of lost family um, overseas. And so Olympia as kind of the grand old lady of the Navy was invited to bring home America's unknown soldier. This is in La Havre, France, where the unknown was brought on board for the trip home. And in fact, we celebrated this fall, the 100th anniversary of the return of the unknown. It was challenging because um, when they brought the casket on board of Olympia, uh, and I grew up in a military family, and I, I sometimes know how the snafus can happen. Uh, when they brought the coffin on board, no one had thought to measure the width of the openings. And so they could not bring the coffin inside of the superstructure. And so uh, what they decided then to do was to tie it to the rear of, uh, to the stern, actually not the full stern, probably the midsection of Olympia and to bring it home that way. And so they lashed it down, the Marine guards stood guard and they brought the body home that way. What they encountered was not one but two what probably we would call today a named hurricane. Um, they were back-to-back -back storms and Olympia was battered and the ship was rolling so much so that the cook actually said he thought the ship was going down. And if the cook says the ship's going down, you ought to start thinking pretty seriously. And the chaplain is reading prayers and it is pitching and rolling and the Marines are lashing themselves to the coffin because they vowed that the coffin will not be washed overboard. And, you know, in her heart, somewhere inside of her, she found the power to muscle her way through. And she arrived at the Naval Yard in Washington, DC. And of course the coffin was transported to where it is today. Um, I think for many of us, certainly in my family, the unknown remains a, a very important part of our family's history. Um, and having had family who knew people who did not come home, that, that the role of, of Olympia remains very, very sacred to all of us. So 1921, she does this. That really is her final act. She is sent to the Naval Yard here in Philadelphia. In 1926, she is invited to be part of the sesquicentennial 
of the United States. This was the 150th anniversary that was held here in Philadelphia. It was, as national celebrations go, a bit of a bust uh, for Philadelphia. It wasn't as big, certainly, as the bicentennial or the centennial, and the events didn't do very well, but Olympia was held out as an important part of America's history, even at that point, in 1926 for the sesquicentennial. And she was, that at that prior, just prior to that, she had been decommissioned. This is an image of her in 1928 um, at the Navy Yard. Well, she didn't stay there for very, very long. Um, people began to realize that this was an important ship. This was an icon. This was a ship that um, was, even at that point, the last of her kind. And so she was turned over to an organization called the Cruiser Olympia Association. And this is a photograph of her being moved actually underneath the Ben Franklin Bridge, which is over my left hand shoulder just behind me along the Delaware River. Uh, and that's where she she sat for many, many years until eventually she was moved down here to Penn's Landing, where she is now. And the Cruiser Olympia Association mer merged with the Independent Seaport Museum creating the organization that we are today, or merging with the organization we are today. Um, she is an amazing, amazing ship, to say the least. Um, and we continue to restore her. And I thought with this image, I would talk a little bit about what we are doing uh, to restore and, and preserve Olympia. Um, there are many historic ships in the United States. In fact, someone told me that the fifth largest Navy in the world consists of all the historic ships that the United States Navy has given away over the years. And of course, right across from where um, Olympia is birthed is the New Jersey. And um, in addition to Olympia, we have the submarine Bakuna, Guppies class submarine. Um, and actually Pennsylvania has two Guppies, one here and then one in Pittsburgh. Um, so there, there are a large number of vessels like Olympia forming former naval vessels that have been given and turned over as museums. But Olympia is, is such a unique ship because there really isn't a parallel to her. Our crew that works to restore her, um, and we've spent a lot of money, and are going to continue to spend a lot of money to restore her, have the challenge that we really don't have necessarily a precedent to look at in terms of how other ships have restored, have been restored like her. She is that, that unusual. Um, and so it's been a challenge for us over the years to figure that out. Now, I, I'm going to preempt a question. I've spoken about Olympia a lot in the last year since I've been here at the Seaport Museum. Uh, and about 10, 12 years ago, um, the museum made, and I'll be honest to say, I think kind of an unfortunate statement that unless Olympia was uh, preserved, that it was going to be towed out off Cape May and turned into a coral reef. That is, I'm not sure why that was said, but I can tell you right now, and I'll look you in the eye and say, that is absolutely not anything that we ever would envision doing. Our intent is to restore Olympia, to have her as a vessel that you and your children and your grandchildren can visit. Um, the question really for us is, what do we restore her to? Her present configuration is actually that of World War I. If you come down and see it, you'll go, well, but Siebert, you told me in World War I she had gun platforms. I see turrets. So here's my dirty little secret. Um, the turrets that you're seeing are fake. They were put on by the Cruiser Olympia Association. They're not real turrets. Um, and they wouldn't probably stand up to a, a, a good sledgehammer, let alone a, a Spanish shell. They were put on to sort of try and backdate her from her World War I appearance. Um, the problem is that much of the rest of the ship actually does appear as it did at the time of the First World War. There were substantial changes made to the superstructure. She was modernized, um, and that's what she really looks like. And that's part of what our restoration is looking at, is how we will restore her and to what period we will restore her. The other challenge that we have with Olympia is, of course, we have a, a, a riveted hull. So I can't send a welder in to hit the, you know, to start re-welding it or I'm going to pop those rivets. So how do we restore the hull? Because finding a riveter is going to be very, very expensive. That's my second challenge. 
Thankfully, Olympia sits in a lovely bed of mud in a, a fresh water environment. So it's a low oxygen environment for the most part. It's not deteriorating at, at a huge rate. My bigger challenge, and actually the one that I, is our biggest issue that we have right now, is when she came out of service, the Navy wanted to preserve her. They knew she was important, but they didn't know how they would, um, what the best way was. And remember, we're in a time period in the 1920s and the 1930s, and even rolling forward to the 40s and the 50s, uh, where preservation technology and the ideas of preservation are really not quite fully built, fully understood. And so um, they recognized that the, the teak deck on Olympia was rotting. When Olympia was fully functioning, fully crewed, it had guys out there caulking and seaming and treating and tarring, and she was in good shape, and she was, in, you know, the, the deck was in good order. By the, the late 20s, the deck was starting to deteriorate. And so the Navy applied a layer of concrete and then a layer of asbestos and then some more concrete over top of the deck. It also filled the bottom of the ship as well with concrete. Um, so we've got wooden deck, concrete, asbestos, concrete. Then the Cruiser Olympia Association and the Seaport Museum in its, in its years have added to that various roofing compounds, various membranes, uh, more concrete, so much so that the deck is now about four to five inches um, below all this slathered on goo. Now the, the challenge is, is all that slathered on goo, the concrete, the asbestos and so forth, is beginning to age. And so we are getting water infiltrating inside the ship. So she's rusting from the inside out. That's actually our biggest challenge. Uh, we know that, and, and I'll tell you about how we're going to resolve that. The other issue that we have had is that when Olympia was fully fitted out, she was balanced between the weight of her engines, the coal, and, of course, the weight of the ammunition that she was carrying. Now, without the coal and the ammunition, she's basically listening to the stern. And in addition, one of her engines was removed by the Cruiser Olympia Association, probably in the 1950s or so. And so she's not balanced anymore. And the lack of balance means all that water that's pooling up that I was describing under getting in, it's now pooling up in low areas, which means we have some really serious water problems inside Olympia. So what our plan is in the next 12 to 24 months is that what we want to do is secure the funding. It's about $12 million, so it's not inexpensive, to go in there and remove all of that. And, of course, when you say asbestos, you know that we're talking about an abatement. To remove the asbestos, to remove all the goop, to get in there and repair all the structural work to the steel of the ship that has deteriorated from the water infiltrating and then put down a new membrane and a new wooden deck um, that will, we can then show off and showcase going forward. We think that's going to be an important step towards preserving Olympia because we get the water from, we don't want it from rusting inside out as a challenge. We stop that, then our next step will be to focus on the hull. We have actually been doing hull work, and it's kind of interesting what we do is a coffer dam. Um, and I don't envy the crew that does this. They actually apply the coffer dam to about a four-foot section of the water line on Olympia. Of course, get the water out, get in there, clean it, apply epoxies and so forth to stabilize the surface, deal with cracks, and then move it along. And, and the water line, of course, is one of our biggest vulnerabilities with and we thank, thank goodness for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. They have provided um, a lot of very, very generous funding through the Keystone Grant Program to do this. So for anyone out there who says, what's my, you know, what are my tax dollars doing? Um, preserving Olympia has been part of this, and it is really, in terms of dealing with the water line, helped to keep Olympia um, afloat and moving forward. So our plans are to, of course, do the deck and continue working on the water line and the hull, 
to restore her appearance to as it was. Inside, um, once we get the, the, the water dealt with, I want to restore Admiral Dewey's cabin uh, because I think people would love to see that. Right now, the water damage is such that we can't show that to the public, but to be able to show Dewey's cabin and all the really interesting pieces to the inside of Olympia. However, if you come here today, you can see her. It's not as though you're going to see a rusty old hulk. We've done great work in keeping her afloat. Uh, what I'm telling you are things that the public doesn't necessarily see. Um, you can come here and visit her and tour her um, and really see what I think is one of America's truly great historic ships, one of a kind, um, and a ship that has witnessed so many aspects of uh, the story of American naval prowess from the end of the 19th century uh, right up through the 1920s and the 1930s. So I'm going to pull back from the PowerPoint and switch over uh, back to just just to me um, and invite you know your questions and, and your comments um, about Olympia would be more than happy to explore those or to talk a little bit more about the Seaport Museum or um, other topics that folks would like to talk about. Thank you, Peter. That was fascinating. And I don't know if it's just me personally because of uh, my emotional bond to the uh, USS Olympia, but uh, certainly you taught me a lot that I didn't know about the ship, and I thought I knew quite a bit. Well, she is. She is. A, I learn about her all the time. And I mean, there are aspects of her buried deep inside of her is a thing called the Fessenden Oscillator which was an early effort at um, naval communication using underwater sound waves. And this may be, we think, the only remaining Fessenden oscillator on the planet, still wow. in Olympia, where they tested her out. So I keep learning cool things about her. So, so the next time we have you back, we're going to ask for some more close-up pictures of the, the mounts, um, those swivel mounts of the... I think mostly aboard is what the six inchers. Um, I don't recall whether or not any of the eight inchers are still on board. Um, no, I didn't think so. I, my recollection is mostly the six inchers um, and uh, the, the oscillator. Uh, I've always was fascinated by the uh, reciprocating steam piston engine, coal fired plant. Uh, as, as an old now, I will say, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take you on it <clears throat> I'm not gonna show you too many pictures inside because I still want you to come and visit us so sure absolutely I want to uh, make sure you know, I, I gotta tease you all a little bit in order to you know have you come and visit us but absolutely her guns were stripped off of her when she went to the Navy yard so the guns that are there now are appropriate but they're not the ones that were there either in World War one or the Spanish America Okay, and then uh, when we saw the the opening picture of her uh, as one of the was she in the Great White Fleet? Was she one of the ships in that uh, global cruise? I I don't recall if she was part, uh, and perhaps some, one of the listeners can uh, comment. I don't believe she was at that point in time. I believe um, that she was not sent out, but I could I could stand to be corrected on that. Okay, so if any of you watching uh, have that answer, please uh, post a comment. Absolutely. Um, and another question, uh, uh, one, I'll make a point that uh, when you mentioned the, uh, uh, the Maine and the explosions on the, the battleship Maine in Havana Harbor, um, one of our lectures from 2021 from Master Chief Hakula included it, his assessment of went went on and so uh i, I invite our uh, listeners to go to the uh, commandery's website and look at past presentations where you will be archived within the next week or so and um take a look at the uh, presentation from master chief hakla uh, if memory serves that was maybe last may um another question came up uh, you indicated she did uh, mine hunting uh, duty during, uh, excuse me, uh, sub hunting duty during World War One. 
was she outfitted with uh, depth charges uh, as part of that? I don't that? believe she was. I don't believe she was. Yeah, I don't recall hearing about that either. I thought maybe you'd have some insights. Um, and in World War One, she had the camouflage, uh, uh, black and uh, haze gray. Yeah, and, and, and let me talk about the color, actually, because many people assume, especially when you look at those prints, that she was white on the day of Manila Bay. In fact, Dewey is recorded as having the ships painted gray. He didn't want them to be that visible of a target. Um, so he, he wanted them definitely, he, he was not looking to, to, to put a big old target in the middle of his forehead. You mean she didn't sail, sail into Manila Bay uh, in uh, bright white and uh, beige? Yeah, he, he was looking at gray. He, he you yeah. uh, know. So uh, two uh, posts, one, she was not, she did not participate in the uh, circumglobal cruise of the Great White Fleet, and her secondary armament were 10 five-inch guns. Correct, and then four eight-inch guns. That's absolutely four right. eight-inch guns. Thank you, thank you, John, who put that in the in the, in the chat. Right. Um, let's see. Moving along. Um, you know, there's that brass plaque on the bridge. You may fire when ready, Gridley. Yeah. What kind of career did Gridley have after his command of the Olympia? Do you have any information? Oh, I, 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 I thought, I, so I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know about Gridley's post-Manila career. What I thought you were going to talk about is there are a pair of brass inlaid feet that you can go up there on the deck of Olympia now and put your feet on, and that's where he supposedly said that. The problem is, is that we have photographs of that area over the last 50 years, and those brass feet have moved about 20 times all over the battle bridge in different spots. And, and it's kind of a staff joke that, um, you know, where they are right now, everybody thinks this is where it happened. I could show you about a dozen different spots where they were moved over time. So that, that's what I thought you were going to allude to, because it's sort of one of the quiet jokes that we have about uh, the, the footprints that Dewey, where he stood and said this, that it kind of it, it kind of moved a little bit over time. So on my next trip down there, I'm going to take particularly close attention to see if those footprints are anywhere near where I recall seeing them as a teen. Yeah, I, I would bet that they may have moved. That that would be that would be my guess. Uh, for sure, because say, the photographs that we have showing the brass footprint shows that. I think as they did work on the deck, they would pry them up and then they put them back. But they they weren't paying that much attention to exactly where they ended up being. Right. So so John raised another uh, great question, and again I'm flashing back to you know you the last time I was there, one could still look at the Commodore's cabin, the skipper's cabin, midshipman's uh, berth, and uh, uh, the um, the cruise accommodations, but uh, maybe you can give us kind of an overview of what life was like for uh, the wardroom and for the others. I will comment just to jump in that when I saw the examples of of um, wardroom china that are on were on display in the '60s anyway, uh, I almost thought they came from the officers' club down at Naval Shipyard, Philadelphia. Um, I wasn't convinced that they came from uh, turn of the century uh, wardroom uh, uh, China, but maybe you can give us a little insight. Absolutely, so it's a great question. So I mean, you know, the officer's cabins and officer's country, uh, when you look at them today, I mean, they are strikingly comfortable looking. They look almost like a steamship cabin. And they were paneled in wood. And it was interesting because the wood paneling was designed to be removed uh, when she went into battle because you didn't want these things splintering and, and the splinters flying around. So when you look at them, particularly um, the, the higher the rank, the better the quarters that you had. Um, and there was an officer's wardroom. Um, and you know, I've seen some of the china and silver. I'll agree with you. Some of it, I suspect, may have been more uh, for duty when she was not at sea, certainly. Uh, 
what we know of life, you know, when she was at sea is that she bounced around like a cork. And a number of her peer ships, there are accounts of them bouncing around. So, I, you know, I, I don't know that I put the best China out. One has to remember, though, that a lot of the naval vessels in this period were intended to be out for short periods and then spend much longer periods back at base and, and back at harbor. And so we talked to the visitor about, particularly with the sailors, and they're in hammocks, they've got the ditty box, they've got a sea bag, they're, they're literally living on top of each other. And people are going, well, is that the way they, you know, it was this 24-7, 365 days of the year? And you go, no, you know, there were quarters, you know, when you were at sea, this is what you're seeing. But when you're back at port, different set of circumstances, not nearly um, as rough and tumble. When you're at sea, certainly, um, if you're one of the crew, it is tough because uh, ventilation is not ideal. I mean, they, the Navy in this period, uh, someone described to me the challenge was that the Navy, the naval engineers who construct Olympia and the others really were putting the crew pretty far down in terms of amenities. It was the armament, it was the speed, it was the efficiency, and then the crew was further down. And you certainly can see that in the sense that the ash hoists, because she had to have ash taken out of her, out of the, out of the boilers, every two to four hours. That has to be brought up on a hoist and then put in a rail, taken over and dumped over the side, and that's right through the middle of where the crew were all basically living. So, I mean, this is, this is smelly, this is noisy. Um, there are stories, certainly, that she's so noisy when the engines are, are running at top speed that no one can hear. Um, you know, there definitely is a, a, an aspect to it, a, a physical aspect of the smell, the sound, and living on top of each other. The flip side was is that Olympia was outfitted with uh, refrigeration. She was the first Navy ship to have an ice maker. And it was realized that if she was out in the Pacific and you wanted to keep that crew healthy, you better have the ability to refrigerate food. Otherwise, um, you're going to be sending a lot of people to, you know, to the head. So you had better refrigerate a lot. And so she had an ice maker. She had the ability to have a fair amount of fresh water. Um, a lot of, of thought was put into that. She traveled, obviously, uh, with a physician on board. Um, so she had those aspects that they were trying to address, but it was still a pretty stinky hot existence for the crew, um, definitely. And when you think about it, 444 uh, Marines and sailors, and the length of the ship, as I mentioned to you, what, is it 344 feet long? Um, that's, that's, that's pretty much standing on top of each other. You don't have a whole lot, of, you, you better, you better love your brother because he's right next to you the whole time. So, I mean, that's sort of some quick highlights for sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, I know underway replenishment of coal was done, uh, I recently read an article about the Russian fleet coming around to, to, you know, get beaten up by the Japanese fleet. Um, did the Olympia do routine underway replenishment? Do you she know? did. She, she did. did. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and really, I mean, this is the story of American expansion in the Pacific. We need all those islands, both uh, for, for storage of coal to replenish the, the ships and, and the tenders who are bringing uh, the coal out to them. So. You know, we need Midway and Wake and so many of these islands for that purpose. Absolutely. You know, it, it uh, takes several days to get from one to the other. And um, even the ships of the Vietnam era, we could only steam for about three days between top offs. And so, um, you know, you're mentioning what's going on with you didn't use the, the M word, but as I'm listening, I'm I'm. I'm watching the metacentric height get higher and higher and higher uh, on the Olympia as things are removed from the hole and your your um, hull keel 
keel level weight is going down and you've got all this weight at deck level, which is actually, was it uh, three decks, uh, four decks uh, below the main deck? So mm -hmm. it actually becomes um, a fair amount of topside weight that you're dealing with. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, we've got to, you know, it's, that to my mind is the big challenge. And the, 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 we, we, we want to do that restoration work actually where she sits. I, I can't really tow her out because the four inches of, of gunk you has actually buried yeah. all of the all of the hardware, for want of a better term, on the deck. So there's right. nothing a tug could tie to her because it's all buried in four inches of it. Well, so we're going to get all that off. Hopefully that's going to put us in a better shape going forward um, and that people will be able to see, uh, you know, kind of an, 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 an Olympia that looks a lot better than she does now. Right. And that ballast concrete, again, depending on how long ago that was poured in there, um, some of the older concretes tend to be um, fairly acidic and, and yeah. they turn fairly corrosive in itself. Yeah, there's, there's, there, we know that that is a big issue with her. You know, right. On one hand, it's stable because it's there, but on the other hand, um, I, I, I'm very nervous about that in, in the long haul. Um, Absolutely. Um, a couple of other questions coming in. One, uh, John is uh, our uh, scrambling historian, and <laughs> uh, he uh, reports that uh, Captain uh, Gridley died in 1898, so his his lifeline was not all that long after the Spanish-American War. Um, he is apparently buried in Erie, Pennsylvania. That is right. He is buried in Erie. I, I, yep. There you go. Uh, and I think you, you touched on it before. Is this a debate that's still going on amongst the trustees of to which era are you? No, I, I think we pretty much agree that we will restore her to her World War One appearance because that is what remains. Okay. Everything, you know, the problem is, is you start getting conjectural as to what was there if we start messing with the superstructure and putting everything back together. Um, the World War One is at least the most accurate and we can get there safest in terms of not messing around with her too much and i think my view is that whatever i would do to her i want a future generation to be able to undo without cursing me too loudly okay. so that's i i think it makes more sense to, to take her to that perspective which will mean bringing back the gun platforms as opposed to the turrets but as i said the current turrets are complete fabrications so okay so, so that one's to that point, um, you know, I know like for the Ranger, which is no more, but it's um, hull models, it's uh, sail plans, and, and a lot of the, its documentation is still well preserved at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Um, what kind of archive of the Olympia's documentation still exists? Or is that there's actually, a, the history? Yeah, there's actually a fair bit between us and the United States Navy. The Navy, of course, has the official record and drawings, we have a lot of things that came from the sailors and so forth who honor, descriptions, photographs. In fact, I just bought on, I bought on eBay, don't tell anybody, but I bought on eBay uh, five photographs of her from the 1920s from the inside after she was decommissioned, which are really useful for us because um, the Cruiser Olympia Association, those guys really tried to restore her. But in a lot of cases, they didn't always have the money to. And so they sold off parts of the ship, the, 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 the valuable metals, particularly in the engines and other areas. So we have parts of the ship where parts are gone that we don't know what's there. So and the drawings don't show that because the Navy changed her over the years and, and right. modified her. We don't always have complete sets of what they did. So photographs and accounts by the guys who were on her or people who worked on her help us sort of figure out, oh, that missing, you know, that that gauge that's sitting in the pile over there actually goes here, um, and that it did something else because these pieces were taken off and sold. Right. So that brings up another question in terms of we've got the Navy has ship plans that probably several full books of them. Um, I wonder how feasible it is 
to have some of those plans converted into electronic, you know, CAD uh, three-dimensional uh, drawings that not only can you use as you're working on restoration plans, but then in the future can be presented as exhibit, uh, virtual exhibit mm -hmm. on board. It's a great idea. And, and if we ever get past COVID, I will pursue it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, I think well, we're, we're not looking at other retreat. A lot of the archives are shut down, and so getting uh, pieces of stuff is so challenging. So if they reopen, I will be the first one to do what you suggested. It's a great idea. One of the things that we want to do is really document her as we peel off the four inch, the four to six inches of gum. We're going to get in there and document her because um, we're going to be able to see the guts of the ship probably for the first time, maybe since she was put together. And so we'll be able to really document her very, very well. Um, and be able to really understand a lot about what's going on. That'll be a really good part of the restoration. I and mean, the restoration will be great. It's just going to be a mess with hazmat and tenting and barges and all that. But I think the end result will be pretty cool. Do you plan on creating a video record of that whole renovation oh, yeah. process? Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're coming up towards the head of the hour. hour. I want to take uh, this opportunity to, to really express my appreciation. Um, uh, some of the comments coming from, I don't know what VOR NGO stands for, but one person wrote that. Another said, nice job, thanks. Uh, and another wrote, fascinating program. You struck a nice balance between history and industrial archeology. span um, And so- uh, she's, she's a pretty cool industrial archeology span study. She really is. You can love the history about her, but boy, the other one is pretty cool too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and you know, it's been really terrific listening to you uh, tell us about the Olympia. And again, anybody who gets a chance to visit Philadelphia, I strongly recommend uh, heading down to the Seaport uh, Museum. Uh, you've got uh, um, not only the, the submarine and the, the ship, but there are other exhibits in that area. Uh, it, it's uh, really a, a terrific area. It, w when I was growing up, it was mostly warehouses and uh, the kind of place my mother kept warning me to stay away from. Um, <laughs> I, I never listened. So um, again, one coming in, very enjoyable and educational. Thank you. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of our attendees. I want to Thank you, Peter, for a terrific presentation. I uh, would remiss if I didn't thank uh, my team, uh, Mark Wixom, who is our commandery's uh, vice commander for communication, and uh, John Parecchio, who is the commandery's uh, chair of the uh, virtual naval history series. And we are looking for volunteers to help John as he uh, plans future presentations. Although he's done a tremendous job, uh, the next uh, five, six months are, are already blocked out, but we're, we're looking towards the future. And again, uh, Peter, I wanna thank you. And with that, I will end the broadcast.